After suffering a stroke and becoming paralyzed on my right side, I moved in with my son, Jack, and his wife post-hospitalization. Hey, we're here. Get out. One day, they invited me for a drive. But when we arrived, it was just a deserted parking lot with an old temporary restroom. Uh, I don't need the restroom. I'll wait here. I answered, but they seemed not to hear me and silently dragged me out of the car. Their demeanor was so strange. At that moment, I was paralyzed with fear. Trembling all over, unable to stand, they looked down at me with a smirk. Then Jack's wife, Anna, picked up my cane that I had dropped and threw it off the cliff into the sea with force. What? Wait! Oh, no! The cane spiraled down and sank into the sea below in an instant. I had no idea what was happening and just stared blankly at the edge of the cliff. Happy birthday! It's almost your birthday, so surprise! They laughed heartily. Then they said, make sure you're back by dinner, and drove away. What on earth did I do to them? Would it be easier to just throw myself off the cliff? I couldn't stop crying, overwhelmed by my miserable situation. My name is Mae Johnson. I married in my early 20s and had kids, a very ordinary stay-at-home mom. My children are Jack and my daughter, Holly. Both were healthy and grew up well. But Jack was a bit too wild. Because of that, my husband and I had a hard time raising him. If I took my eyes off him for a moment, he'd be climbing trees or fences, entering someone else's property without permission, eating berries, or trampling through gardens, catching bugs. Moreover, he often forcefully took his friend's toys and broke them. We were constantly apologizing and compensating for Jack's troubles. When he started elementary school, we got calls from the teacher weekly and had to attend special meetings and accompany him to and from school. Fortunately, I was a full-time housewife from that time on, so I thought, it's better than him getting into trouble. He'll settle down when he's older. Thanks to that, elementary school went smoothly, but he still caused trouble playing with friends in the evenings. As he moved into upper elementary, middle, and high school, he increasingly behaved problematically out of our sight. His high school years were especially bad. With frequent nights out, unpermitted stays, fights with students from other schools, and even police issues. When Jack was at home, I worried, what has he gotten into now? And couldn't sleep. Luckily, he didn't turn to crime and managed to graduate from high school. However, after graduation, he didn't go to college and worked various part-time jobs instead. My husband and I worried, will he ever get a steady job? But fortunately, a gas station manager liked his work ethic and he became a full-time employee. That changed Jack. He became serious and stopped causing trouble. He also moved out at 33 to live with his then-girlfriend, now wife, Anna. My husband and I were grateful to the manager and Anna, relieved that our long years of parenting struggles were finally over. On the other hand, Holly, six years younger than Jack, was the complete opposite. While we were busy with Jack, she quietly drew or read books. 
and when I felt overwhelmed by parenting, she would tenderly comfort me. Even when I felt like a failure and wanted to give up, Holly's kindness made me think I need to keep going for Holly's sake. To me, Holly was truly a pillar of support. As she reached high school, she began to experience some nightlife. My husband was very worried, but I wasn't as concerned. Because, unlike the perpetually missing Jack, Holly always stayed in touch. Even when she chose to live in a dorm in college, she frequently called and visited home. And when she started living alone after getting a job, she continued to do so without change. Looking back, she was probably worried about us dealing with Jack, who was still living at home at the time. Being the kind soul she was, it's no surprise that Holly met her significant other quickly. He was a guy named Ryan Sanders, her boss at work. After dating for about two years, they got married following Ryan's job transfer and moved out of state four months after the wedding. She still calls as before, but living far away makes frequent home visits too difficult so we only see Holly a few times a year now. Learning this, I felt a mix of happiness for her marriage and sadness about her moving away, but I didn't want to hinder her life and silently prayed for their happiness from affair. Jack, who had said he was moving in with someone, lived about an hour's drive from our home but hardly ever contacted us. We only met during long holidays. More for him to enjoy holiday meals or stay over than to visit us, making me feel like a servant every time. Still, I accepted it happily, thinking at least he was independent and working seriously. Each leading their separate lives, I was enjoying a peaceful life with my husband for the first time in decades. We thought having grandchildren would make life even more enjoyable. But then my husband collapsed in the bathroom and passed away from a stroke caused by heat shock. Our old house gets extremely cold in the dressing area during winter. I was aware of heat shock risks from TV and used a fan heater as a precaution. But that day, for some reason, the fan heater wasn't on, leading to a drastic temperature change between the dressing area and bathroom, causing his stroke. By the time I found him, he was already unconscious and passed away shortly after. The police later confirmed it was an accident with no foul play involved. I wondered why the fan heater wasn't on, as it wasn't broken. The police suggested it was probably due to him forgetting to turn it on, which is a common oversight. Though I accepted this explanation, I still wondered. Wouldn't I notice the absence of the heater's sound if it was off? But dwelling on it wouldn't change anything. So I decided to organize my husband's belongings to cope. I thought it would be straightforward, but the task often brought back images of my husband's fall, filling me with guilt for not noticing the fan heater, and left me in tears. I couldn't make any progress as a result. I was likely depressed at that time. Again, Holly supported me during that period, taking time off work to visit me repeatedly. Hey, Mom, you don't have to rush sorting through everything. We have plenty of time. Oh, look at this photo. It brings back memories. She would say that, comforting me with her presence and smiles. Thanks to Holly, 
I managed to avoid losing myself and came to terms with my husband's death as a tragic accident. Years have passed since then, and I still live alone in our family home. To be honest, living alone in such a big house feels lonely, but I've decided to keep these feelings to myself, considering my age. Then one day, I suffered a stroke, caused by heat shock again. Despite my previous doubts about forgetting to turn on the power, I had indeed forgotten it myself, something I never expected. Fortunately, the season was different this time, so my life wasn't in danger. However, being alone meant it took a long time before I could call an ambulance. As a result, I ended up with a severe disability of being paralyzed on my right side. A long hospital stay for brain surgery and rehabilitation was decided, and I asked Jack, who lived nearby, to bring me the things I needed for my admission. Hospital. How many days? I mean, I've got work, you know. It's not decided yet, but I think it's going to be quite long. So could you just prepare and bring the admission kit for me, please, Jack? Ah, well, I'll help if I'm free. Take care, then. He said that, handing up the phone abruptly. I sighed deeply, still holding the receiver. If I'm free, is Jack's usual way of declining. When he says that, it's almost certain he won't do anything. Still, I kept calling him repeatedly. I understood Jack's situation, but I couldn't leave the hospital, so I had no choice but to keep asking. After a week of contacting him, Jack finally came around. Thank you, Jack. You really helped me out. Hey, Mom. Is your illness really that bad? Eh? Oh well, yes. It seems there's no prospect of recovery. But it's okay. I'll make sure not to trouble you guys. Is that so? Seeing Jack's unusually serious expression made me feel uneasy. As it was hard to imagine him being genuinely concerned about me especially when he had been so indifferent even when my husband died. After Jack left, I kept pondering why he looked so solemn. Seeing a patient in a wheelchair reminded me. He might be worried about my need for care. This realization fit so well, I felt it had to be the right answer. I started thinking about how to live without being a burden to Jack and Holly. Depending on the rehabilitation outcome, it was almost certain I would need further medical care. It might be safer to consider moving into a facility. The only problems were the financial aspects of it and what to do with the house. First, I need to focus on rehabilitation. If I could regain some movement in my right side, it would make my life much easier and reduce the cost of care. Still, that alone wasn't enough, so I thought about discussing the house the next time someone visited. That would probably be in two or three months, giving me plenty of time to think. The following day, Jack and Anna came to visit together which was surprising since they never visited unless it suited them. Were they worried about my care, coming to check on my condition? Having had no time to prepare, I made do with casual conversation that day. But then they visited daily, bringing magazines to alleviate my boredom and even flowers. Initially skeptical, by the time my discharge was foreseeable, 
I felt genuinely touched by their concern. One day, Holly visited after a long absence. Sorry I couldn't come sooner. It's okay. You have your job and family. Don't worry about me too much. Don't say that, Mom. Your family, too? Holly's unwavering kindness soothed me. By the way, my discharge seems near. I'm thinking of moving into a facility. A facility? What for? I explained my condition and the idea of moving into a facility to Holly. She was aware of my after effects, but was surprised I considered living in a facility. Then she fell silent. I'm sorry for not saying anything, but living in that house with my condition is difficult, and it's safer in a facility, right? That's true, but if you're just worried about living alone, why not live with us? Really? But what would Ryan think? I don't think he'd oppose it. But yeah, let's discuss it as a couple, and then I'll bring it up again. If you're okay with it, Mom, I'd like to live together with you. Holly said that, showing me the same cheerful smile she had as a child. To be honest, I wanted to live with them too. But Holly has her own job and family. If I lived with them, I would burden Holly and her husband, Ryan. That thought made it hard for me to simply accept the offer. Hey Holly, what are you talking about without asking? Jack, why are you angry? At the entrance of the hospital room, Jack suddenly shouted angrily and stormed in followed by an upset-looking Anna. Of course, I'm mad. What's all this talk about doing whatever you want? We've been visiting mom every day. Jack said that, glaring at Holly with a fierce look. But Holly, being used to Jack's temper, wasn't phased at all, and retorted with a look of disbelief. So what? This seemed to infuriate Jack even more, as he harshly retorted. That means we have the right to live together. You, you moved out of state and neglected your parents. Stay out of this. Jack, moving away was unavoidable for her. So there's no need to talk like that to your sister. Mom, stay out of this. Listen, Holly. We've been preparing to live with mom for a long time. So, we're the ones who will live with her, got it? Holly and I were both shocked by the claim of preparing to live together. Though they visited frequently, there had never been any talk of living together from Jack and Anna. Not even a question about my discharge date. Anna, is that true? Doubting Jack's reliability, I instinctively asked his wife Anna. She smiled and said, of course, we can't leave you alone in this condition. At that moment, living with Jack and Anna seemed almost decided forcibly. Although I felt a bit discontented for not being able to choose my own living arrangements, I believed in their kindness at that time and thought living together would be all right. However, I would come to regret this thought greatly. When I first visited Jack and Anna's house after discharge, I couldn't believe my eyes. Their home, provided by Anna's relative for free, was nearly as old as mine. With many uneven floors and narrow corridors and entrances, that made walking difficult. There were clutters scattered everywhere, making it easy to trip. With no handrails and a cramped restroom. The only exception was the bathroom, 
which was a walk-in unit with no steps and a warm dressing area due to recent renovations. At least the bathroom is safe. I initially fought but using it with my paralyzed right side was frightening and nearly impossible without a half-filled tub or handrails. In the end, I was resigned to taking showers only, regardless of the season. They said they were preparing to live together with me, but what exactly did they prepare? I wondered to myself as I put up with living in a house that only raised more questions. Perhaps it simply couldn't be helped, as living together was a new experience to us. However, my patience didn't just wear thin, it snowballed into something much larger. Once, I folded laundry for Jack and his wife, both working full-time, thinking I was helping. Seeing this, they bizarrely asked me to help with even more chores. Take care of the bathroom cleaning, will you? Consider it part of your rehab. From tomorrow, please take out the trash and clean up because friends are coming over. It's all for your rehab, right? I kept enduring their constant demands under the guise of rehab but there's only so much a person with right side paralysis can do. I finally spoke up, asking them to reduce the household workload. But Jack just yelled, it's your rehab, so stop complaining and just do it. Far from easing, they even made me responsible for the most challenging task, cooking, criticizing me daily for bad and slow meals. I never expected that the two, who were so kind during my hospital stay, would turn so drastically once we started living together. Initially, I thought they were just irritable due to the unfamiliar setting of living together. But as I was yelled at and insulted daily, I began to think maybe my actions were provoking their anger I felt increasingly cornered, and soon I was jittery at the slightest sound, never finding a moment of peace. How many more years must I endure these painful days? Thinking about the future made me wish I hadn't survived my stroke. My spirit was utterly broken. One day, after living with Jack and his wife for over six months, the three of us drove to a nearby supermarket. On the way back, Jack suddenly said, Hey, as a thank you for all the housework you do, let's go for a little drive. While Anna nodded happily in the passenger seat, I felt incredibly disappointed. A mountain of chores awaited me at home and I feared the scolding and insults if they weren't completed quickly. But I had no right to voice my opinion. So I just silently gazed out the window. The car drove deeper into a deserted, dimly lit mountain road. Where were we heading? Just then, the view suddenly brightened. We arrived at a desolate parking lot equipped only with an old temporary restroom backed by a sheer cliff it felt like the climax of a suspense drama were they planning to take a restroom break but that old restroom was too cramped for me i decided to stay in the car sitting idly hey what are you zoning out for we're here get out Eh, I don't need the restroom. I'll wait here. I replied, but they didn't seem to hear me and dragged me out of the car. Their eyes were cold and disdainful, as if looking at trash. Overwhelmed with fear, I lost the ability to speak. They forcefully took me to the railing by the cliff's edge. Could they be planning to push me off? 
A chilling terror seized me, freezing me in place as my whole body trembled. While I stood there, unable to move, they smirked down at me. Then Anna picked up my cane, which I had dropped, and hurled it off the cliff into the sea with force. Wait, oh, no. The cane spiraled down, sinking instantly into the sea below. I was clueless and just stared blankly at the edge of the cliff. Happy birthday! It's almost your birthday, so surprise! That was hilarious. It flew off with such force. You were just like yourself back in your track and field days. That's irrelevant, don't you think? Anyway, we're heading back first. Oh, make sure you're back for dinner. If you need your cane, go fetch it yourself, okay? We won't help. Bye. With that, they drove off, laughing heartily. Birthday, surprise. This was just cruel bullying. At that moment, my heart was completely shattered. What on earth had I done to them? Would it be easier to just throw myself off the cliff? I couldn't stop my tears over my miserable situation. Reaching into my pouch for a tissue, I saw the charm Holly had given me. Right, I should ask Holly for help. I usually refrain from worrying her, but this time, I was desperate. If I could just contact Holly, things might get better. I tried to move toward where people were. But without my cane, I couldn't stand or walk. Looking around for something to use as a cane, I found nothing. Feeling utterly hopeless, a car then entered the parking lot. Thinking I was saved, I desperately called out. Please help. Mom? At the same time I called out, I heard Holly's voice calling me. Holly jumped out of the car and ran to me, embracing me tightly. Holly, is it really Holly? It's me. I'm so glad you're safe. It felt surreal, like witnessing a miracle. As the person I longed to see appeared before me unexpectedly. I touch Holly's head, cheeks, shoulders, and hands repeatedly to confirm her presence. Oh, it's really you. It's really Holly. Holly nodded and hugged me tightly. Then, along with her husband, Ryan, helped me into their car. We decided to come see you when your location on the GPS hadn't changed for a while, making us worried. What happened? Well, I explained to Holly and Ryan about being abandoned and how I felt living with Jack and his wife. I wish I had gone to a facility instead. I regret it so much. As I recalled, tears started flowing again. Holly hugged me once more, comforting me. You did nothing wrong, Mom. I regret leaving you with my brother. I won't forgive him this time. Seeing Holly so angry was a first for me, her mother. We decided to go to Jack's house for a confrontation. While driving, I asked Holly several puzzling questions. Holly, how did you know I was there? And you weren't supposed to visit today, right? Well, your birthday was coming up, and I planned a surprise because you seemed down lately. Holly explained how she ended up rescuing me. We had a tradition of throwing a surprise party for birthdays. Though calling it a surprise became a bit predictable. However, the details were always kept secret. 
I had forgotten about this tradition since Jack and Holly moved out. And I found your location thanks to the charm I gave you, remember? It has a GPS tracker. Did you tell me about it? I remember you telling me to always carry it. I realized I hadn't fully grasped the modern features Holly mentioned. But thankfully, I had kept my promise to carry it, which likely saved me. I felt deeply grateful for Holly, who always cared for me from afar. Soon, we arrived at Jack's house. Laughter from inside hinted they were unaware of our approach. Holly, with a fiercer look than before, used the keys I gave her to silently enter the house. What? Holly? Why? You worthless brother. You're no family. You're such a disgrace. Holly's fierce demeanor made everyone present recoil in fear. Hey, what's the deal barging in like this? Mom isn't here right now. Wait, Mom. Are you kidding me? My presence stunned everyone. Upon noticing me, Jack and his wife turned pale as if they had seen a ghost. Overwhelmed by the return of my anxiety, I felt unable to stand. But Ryan quickly led me to a chair in the living room. And Holly rushed over asking if I was okay. The difference between my son and daughter astonished me. Jack, what is this? How could you make our half-paralyzed mother live in such a terrible place? And what about leaving her stranded earlier? What are you thinking? Shut up. I don't care about this old hag. I thought by making her work, we'd get the inheritance sooner, but she's useless. Jack's callous words shocked me, Holly, and Ryan. We were left speechless. Well, she's still going to the hospital, right? It's about time. We've taken care of her so all the insurance money should be ours. Jack boasted, with Anna praising him proudly. Their ridiculous demeanor left me more astonished than angry. But why did the insurance money come up suddenly? When I asked Jack, he said, when you asked for the admission set, didn't you say you needed a stamp? While searching for it, I found your bank book and insurance papers. Anna had told him that relatives who provide care often receive a larger share of the inheritance, prompting their forceful cohabitation plan. Realizing my naive misjudgment, I understood then that their kindness wasn't out of love or concern, but for the money after my death. I thought I'd get the inheritance soon after hearing about your hospitalization. We panicked when you talked about moving to a facility, and Holly suggested living together. Then you started helping around the house. Are you really sick? When will I get the inheritance? Jack's harsh words deepened my disappointment. Yet, I saw this as an opportunity. I clarified to Jack that my hospitalization was not life-threatening and my visits were for monitoring, preventive measures, and rehabilitation advice. So I'm still quite fit. Now that inheritance came up, let's clear this up. I'll pass everything, including the insurance and inheritance, to Holly and Ryan. What? Wait, the inheritance is mine, right? Jack's absurd claim baffled me. His plan was to disinherit Holly by claiming he alone took care of me and managed my affairs. However, I wasn't dying, and his nonsensical plan was far from reality. It seems Jack's mind was filled with nothing but the thought of getting money the easy way. 
fearing they might concoct more schemes for my estate. I made a significant decision. I understand your thoughts now. Since that is the case, I now disown you, Jack. My strong declaration turned Jack and Anna pale. Disown? You're joking, right? How will I repay my debts? That's right. I bought three designer bags and even a new car, thinking we'd get a big sum. We're in trouble now. Jack and Anna had recklessly spent, assuming they'd receive my insurance and inheritance, and had even gambled their money away, accumulating debts. Even if we lost big, we thought we could cover it with the inheritance. Mom, lend us some money, at least $10,000 for now. Dismissing Jack's ludicrous request, I decided to return to my beloved home, packing only essentials. Back home, I opted for in-home care services that provide bath and household support allowing me to have some peace despite the cost. Despite my declaration of having disowned him, Jack and Anna persistently begged for money. Choosing times when care services were absent to make loud, threatening visits. Their appalling behavior led to frequent police reports. Eventually, they barged in, attempting to steal my bank book leading to their arrest for attempted burglary. The fear of their return lingered, preventing a truly peaceful life. One day, Holly and Ryan urgently visited, cautiously checking the surroundings and locks. Holly, why are you looking around so anxiously? Two days ago, a friend saw Jack being chased by some menacing individuals near the station. Concerned for my safety, Holly rushed over, proposing to live together again. Ryan agrees too. We can't leave you alone anymore. Please, come with us, Mom. Holly, despite my condition, please take care of me. I said to her sincerely, from the bottom of my heart. Holly's joyful tears warmed everyone present. After selling my old house, I moved to Holly and Ryan's accessible new home. Surprised by the barrier-free design. My room is placed next to the entrance, and it is equipped with a special bed. Private bathroom and handrails everywhere. Even if you end up using a wheelchair, it'll be easy to move around. The private bathroom allows you to use it comfortably. All these were Ryan's ideas. Holly smiled happily, and Ryan grinned sheepishly beside her. Once again, I felt truly fortunate to be living with this couple. Currently, Holly is expecting a new addition to their family, as she plans to become a full-time homemaker after giving birth. She's also studying to be more prepared for caregiving if needed. While I can still move, I want to do my best for my family. So I'm actively helping with Holly's household chores. Life has been tough since my husband passed away but I finally found a place of peace. I'm committed to my rehabilitation through household tasks, hoping this happiness lasts. I am determined to maintain my current condition as long as possible, especially for the grandchild who will be arriving soon.